We're going to look for the next few weeks at a passage, Philippians 2, and uh, the early verses of that chapter. So if you've got a Bible, please turn to Philippians 2. It will be on the screen as well. And uh, we're going to start from verse 1 and just read the first five verses together. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love. Can we say having the same love? being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this in mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Amen. And Paul here, it's written by Paul the Apostle. Paul is writing to... um, probably from prison, likely he was in prison in Rome, and he's writing to a church that he loves because they've actually been helping him. They've been, they sent uh, someone to help him while he, he was in ho- under house arrest, Epaphroditus, you can read about him, and they sent gifts and things to support Paul. And he, he is writing to that church, partly to report on how he's doing, but also to really encourage them to be united in the faith. He's concerned about their unity. And he doesn't even refer to himself as an apostle in this letter. He talks about being a fellow servant of Christ, of being just one of us and working together to be united to serve Jesus Christ. And in fact, he's appealing out of his suffering. He, he's going through hardship. Obviously, he's imprisoned. And uh, he's appealing for this oneness out of his own suffering. And when he says if, so if there is any encouragement in Christ here, He's, he's not saying just in case there is. It's not asking a question. He's actually saying since, because you have this, then please will you respond in this way. He's saying since you have encouragement in Christ, comfort in the love of God and participation in the Spirit, then I'm appealing to you to complete my joy to do these things. Does that make sense to you? complete my joy. And over these next three or four weeks, we're going to look at what it means from this passage to have one heart, the same love, to have one mind, to be united in our faith, and to have one purpose. I think it's Graham who's going to be looking at that. Hey, yeah. Um, so we'll look at those things. But today, I want to talk about having the same love and being one in heart. And the recipe for oneness, for this unity, is in this passage. Because it's the Trinity is the recipe for unity. Our oneness, as Rousseau said at one, needs to look like the oneness of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And Paul uses that example. And here he's saying, well, first of all, you're going to get your encouragement in Christ. In Christ is one of Paul's great themes throughout his his letters. We are in Christ. That's where we get our encouragement. It's not because we know about Christ, but because we're in Christ. It's a constant encouragement if we embed ourselves in Jesus Christ. And then we get the power and the comfort of God's love. And not just for the lovable, sorry. You know, we don't just love our mates. No, we have God's love poured into our hearts so that we have the comfort of God's love. And then we have the share in the Holy Spirit. The fellowship of the Holy Spirit, literally, that's what it means here. And the Holy Spirit, one of his great works is unity, of unifying us, of sanctifying us. Paul says in Thessalonians, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So making us more holy is his task. And making Jesus known to us, that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in fellowship. And not only to us, but through us to the world. So here we have this beautiful picture that Paul has given the church in Philippi of how unity works, encouragement from Christ, the love of God and the fellowship, the sharing in the Holy Spirit. And then that's why he says to them, you know, have the same mindset as Christ. Have the same mindset as Christ in your relationships with one another. So if we think about love for a moment, You know, love 
for one another is the overflow of God's love in our hearts. That's what he's saying here. It's not our puny love, but it's the love that God pours into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5 verse 5, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You see, this same love, when uh, Paul says, have the same love for one another, that comes from being full of the Holy Spirit. See, otherwise it's impossible. You know, you, you and I can't love God the way we need to love God, and I can't love you and you can't love me the way we should unless we're doing it from a heart full of God's love, poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. You know, depending on me means my love's going to be weak and useless. And do you ever find that? You know, it's quite hard to love sometimes, isn't it? But when we're full of God's Spirit, that the overflow of our heart is God's love. It's so important. And, and Paul actually concludes a lot of his letters this way. Just 2 Corinthians 13, verse 13. I like this. He says, I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will bless you and be kind to you. There's the encouragement. And then may God bless you with his love. May he bless you with his love. We were singing about it so beautifully this morning. And then may the Holy Spirit join all your hearts together. See that beautiful picture of Father, Son, and Spirit working together so that we can be united. It, it's a beautiful picture, isn't it? I, I, I love the way that so um, comes out of Scripture when we, when we read it. And today, I have to ask us a question. Are we full of the love of God? Are you in your heart today full of the love of God? And it's overflowing because you're so full of His Holy Spirit. Because unless we have that, we're not going to have this oneness that we're looking at in this series. Am I making sense here? Good. Because um, what I want to do this morning is I want to take that picture of the God's love in our hearts and talk about what that looks like when we are united in this way. How does the love of God work out in, in uniting us together? And the first thing is we're united in our love for God. As God pours His love into our hearts, our response is to return it back to Him. That's what we're called to do. That Jesus, in fact, said, didn't He, that it's the first priority. Matthew 22, 36 to 38. He's approached, and they're testing Him, they're, they're trying to catch Him out, and they say, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And these are the guys that are the experts in the law. These are the ones that know the law inside out, backwards and sideways. And he says to them, and he said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with some of your heart. All of your heart. All of your heart. And with all of your soul and with all of your mind. This is the great and the first commandment. So our first priority as a body is to love God. I was listening to um, Keith Green. Who knows about Keith Green? Yeah, all the oldies know about Keith Green, yeah? <laughs> Keith Green, do you know, um, since Keith Green passed away, it's over 30 years ago now, so um, amazing. But his ministry is still echoing through the church. And uh, I was listening to him talking about a song he wrote. And uh, he told the story of how he'd written a letter to the Lord. And he kept it in his Bible because he didn't know where to mail it to. <laughs> And basically, in this letter, he'd said, Lord, you've got to do something about my heart. Because I've known you a while, and uh, not through anything that I'm doing, but more through the things I'm not doing, my heart is just growing a little bit cold, and maybe a little bit tired, and a little bit callous. Um, and there's a, few there's a little bit of hardness coming into my heart. And it's not because I don't want to love you anymore. It, it's just because I'm getting weary and uh, I want you to do something about it, Lord. And he wrote this song called, Oh Lord, You Are Beautiful. Do you know it? Yeah. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I seek. And when your eyes are on this child, your grace abounds to me. You know it? You do now. <laughs> a slightly poor version of it, but you know it. 
And then the second verse caught my attention because it says, Oh Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love that burns with holy fear. We were learning this week at the worship leaders forum that Jonathan led. Ewan said something. He said, sometimes before you sing a song, you need to read the words without the music to see what's in the heart of the song. And you read those words and you catch the heart, don't you? A heart that wants to burn with holy fear. Let's sing it together. Oh, Lord, please light the fire. That once burned bright and clear. Replace the lamp of my first love. That burns with holy fear. Yes, Lord. Oh. Oh, I could stop there. You know, this is so important, church. To be truly united, for us to be one together, we need the lamp of our first love burning bright. You know, the only way I'm going to love you enough and you're going to love me enough is when we come together that the lamp of our first love for Jesus Christ is aflame and intense in our hearts. It's so important. And you know, it's out of our response to his love that we do this. We love because he first loved us, John wrote, in 1 John 4 verse 19. And Romans 5 verse 8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, while we didn't love him, Christ died for us. Now, if our love gets cold or tired, do you know what happens? We rob one another of the blessing of God and the power of God. If I come on a Sunday morning and my first love is not burning bright, then I'm going to rob you of something that the unity of us um, brings in the power of God. Because the Bible teaches us there's a commanded blessing from the Lord when we are together as one. So if we come with a love for Jesus burning in our hearts, we're all going to benefit. I'm going to benefit from you and you're going to benefit from me. And as we heard this morning, we're going to minister to Jesus in the way that he deserves. You know, and you can't worship that way without passion. uh, I've got a little news flash that I I caught to read to you. This is from a very cheeky website called Babylon B. I don't know if anyone uh, ever looks at Babylon B. But this is this report that it says... um, Psalms experts, this is coming from the experts in Psalms, lift up your hands actually means just stand there with your hands in your pockets. U.S. Academy foremost experts on the Hebrew book of Psalms are now claiming the phrase often translated as lift up your hands is better actually rendered just stand there with your hands in your pockets. Scholarship now suggests that rather than lifting our hands in worship to God, the best way to convey affection, adoration, and reverence is by standing as still as possible while singing praises to him. The Hebrew term can include some light swaying, of course, but it's not intended to convey ecstatic body motions, said Dr. Michael Pagui, a renowned made-up New Testament scholar. Mostly, it just means you're supposed to put your hands in your pockets, cross your arms, or fold your hands in front of you. And then it says, while findings like this often don't make waves, this report is an exception. Chris Tomlin, who's a worship leader, caught wind of the information and quickly released a version of Holy is the Lord with a new first line. We stand and fold up our hands for the joy of the Lord is our strength. (laughs) I mean, it's a bit sarcastic isn't it (laughs) Um, but the point is well made you know that when we come and our first love is burning we can't worship like this no our passion is evident by our body and how we come you know if we sing Jesus I love you I pour out my affection and devotion I seriously don't think we can do that singing Jesus how I love you Jesus yeah Pouring out my effect. No, come on. No, we're passionate, aren't we? Because Jesus has done everything for us. And, and the second thing that when we come together, 
and we're burning with first love is our hearts are waging war on sin. Psalm 97 verse 10 says, Let those who love the Lord hate evil, for he guards the lives of his faithful ones and delivers them from the hand of the wicked. Let those who love the Lord hate evil. And then what happens is, as we do that, as we wage war on sin in our lives, what happens is he guards the lives of his faithful ones. The guard of the Lord comes over our lives and he delivers us from the enemy. But a love for the Lord means we cannot enjoy having sin in our lives. Peter wrote this in 1 Peter 2, verse 1 to 3. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. So put away everything that is going to hinder us. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into your salvation. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. You see what we're saying that if we recognize this thing that we are loving because he first loved us. And that he loved us while we were still in our sin. Then our response is to put away anything that's going to hinder that. As God's love is poured into our hearts. Our hearts and our love is poured back to him. By worshipping him with all our might. And making ourselves as holy as we possibly can. Of course we'll trip up. And his grace is there. But we we wage war on sin in our hearts and our lives. We don't want to allow it into our hearts. You know I was reading the story of. Father Raniero Cantalamessa. Yeah. And uh, this can- Father Raniero was um, an envoy of the Vatican. And he was sent to Kansas City. And he was sent to Kansas City as an observer. This was in 1977. As an observer to a Christian conference. And at this conference, there were 40,000 people. 20,000 were Roman Catholics. And 20,000 were other Christians of, of all sorts. And uh, as he was observing this conference, a moment came where whoever was teaching that day was talking about the damage that division does in the church of not pursuing purity in the church. And uh, in that moment, 40,000 people fell to their knees and began to repent. And, and he, said, he, he said that in that moment... He looked up and he saw um, Jesus' Lord on a neon sign. And beneath this neon sign, there were 40,000 people knelt in repentance. And he said, I got a glimpse of Christian unity, of what Christian unity was all about. Not some ecumenical mishmash. It wasn't that suddenly the church all joined up and became one thing. But no, it was 40,000 Christians in repentance under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. And then he was so moved by this moment that he turned to someone who was just um, a lay minister from um, another denomination. And he said, please, will you pray for me to encounter the Holy Spirit? And as this person prayed for him, just an ordinary saint like you or I, um, he found the Holy Spirit just falling on him. And he found himself speaking in tongues. says, I was speaking in a manner like speaking in tongues. And the word of God just came sparkling alive in his life. And in that moment of everyone under the lordship of Christ, forgetting um, selfish ambition, as Paul was saying, and just focusing on the lordship of Christ, the power of God came. And in fact, his ministry was opened up and he became the, the preacher to the, um, the Vatican. But as I say, the point here was not some... Um, marrying of ecumenical differences. The point was that under the Lordship of Christ, the power of God can fall. When we agree that being holy and saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Lord, I want to put aside anything that hinders, any slander, any negativity, then your power can come. And that's what happens when we're one, when we're loving God together. Amen. So I want to ask today, Have you got baby skin around your heart? Keith Green, when he wrote that letter, what he said was, Lord, I want to have baby skin. Now, I held a brand new baby this week at the hospital. And baby skin is like so soft and fragile 
and uh, it, it can easily be damaged and hurt. And what he was saying is, that's the sort of skin I want around my heart, Lord. Fragile skin that is open to your correction, that is loving with the first love of Jesus Christ. Have you got baby skin around your heart this morning? H- have you got a baby skin love for Jesus that says, Lord, I want to kneel before you in repentance for the things that hurt you. And I want to, as we said this morning, give you everything. Because as we do that, that's going to unite us, church. That's going to bring the power of God right into this place. Amen. And then the second thing and the last thing that I want to cover is united in love for the church. Paul in Philippians 2 lists the killers of unity, selfish ambition, You know that the great men of God always had a sense of their own unworthiness? Desire for personal prestige. The purpose should be self-obliteration, he's saying. Getting self out of the way. And concentration on self, that's an enemy of unity because it means it eliminates others from our heart. If we're so taking up everything in our hearts about ourselves, then there's no space for others. So what he's saying is create space around your heart for other people by not focusing on yourself. 1 John 4, 7 to 8 says this, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. I mean, that is pretty scary stuff, isn't it? If we don't have love in our heart, then John is saying, Maybe we don't even know God. If we can't love God and we can't love our brothers and sisters, perhaps we need to come and get to know God because God is love and anyone who does not love does not know God. You know the Apostle John, he lived in Ephesus into his old age. In fact, he had Jesus' mother Mary living with him for for a time there. And when he was very old in the church there, the, the disciples used to have to carry him into church. So every Sunday, uh, maybe Sunday, I don't know which day it was, but let's say it's Sunday. But every time the church met, they, they had to actually carry John into the church. And then as they carried him in, they brought him to the front and they said, um, you know Jesus, you, you were with Jesus. Wow, please share a word with us. Tell us something. And uh, what he said was, little children, love one another. And, and they said to him, you always say that. Master, why do you always say that? Ev- every time you say the same thing. And it's written that he's, his reply was this. It is the Lord's command, and if this alone be done, it is enough. And I think he was remembering what Jesus had taught the disciples. You remember what Jesus said in John 13? A new commandment I give to you. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Can you imagine what John must have felt when he thought back about that moment? Jesus said to us, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And he would have remembered that Jesus loved enough to go to the cross, to die for us. And now he's remembering that Jesus said, just as I loved you, you have to love one another. That's a powerful picture. And he must have known. That's why he was repeatedly saying to them, love one another, love one another, because Jesus said, I loved enough to die for you and to come out of the grave and to give you new life and salvation and hope. Now I want you to take that love and love each other that way. Wow. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. It's a high standard, but me-centered agendas destroy unity in the church. It's just a fact. The, The destruction of unity in the church is never from the outside. It's always from the inside. In fact, attack from the outside tends to bring greater unity in the church. It's division in the inside that will break unity amongst us. So how do we love for unity? Well, first, we, we prioritize when we're together. Yeah. You know, we, we don't neglect meeting together. Coming together on a Sunday in life group is our priority. 
D.L. Moody said this, he said, church attendance is as vital to a disciple as a transfusion of rich, healthy blood to a sick man. And, and can I tell you that um, Carol will confirm this, that on a Sunday after the service, what's the first thing I do, Carol? Yeah. It, it's worry about who wasn't there. As I'm even getting into the car, I'm, I'm saying, oh, I wonder where they were. I must find out if they're okay or ask their life group leader if, if they're okay. And your life group leaders are like that as well, you know. That our hearts are so for sharing together the love of God and the power of living in community and the encouragement of that V formation of the geese that our desire is to prioritize coming together. It's so Im important for us, you know. Jesus actually said this. He said, if, if you love your parents or your children more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. And yet sometimes we just miss church gatherings so easily. You know, because something else is happening. Um, we don't prioritize it, do we? I mean, sometimes we prioritize family. We prioritize work. We prioritize activities. We prioritize just going off, doing something. You know, and it's not, hear me right, it's not wrong sometimes to have to do something else. But our heart has to be that if there's one priority, it's to be with the people of God to encourage one another, not to be easily distracted from other things. That's what this type of unity looks like. It says, if I'm going to choose anything, I'm going to choose to love my brothers and sisters by being with them, by worshipping with them, by encouraging them. And even if I feel a bit low, I'm going to come and get encouragement from being with them. You know, there are, as Joel's word said, there are those that sometimes need to be at the back of the flock because they're tired and they just need to be pulled along by the others. And there are others who are strong now and, and encouraging. Say, come on, keep going, keep going. We are together. But we prioritize meeting together. And you know that socializing together is also part of this. Th there's a phrase. I don't know who ever made it up. Let's say it was Eric. Um, <laughs> that love hangs out. Love hangs out. I, I love our ladies on a Monday. Is Regina here somewhere? She's the crochet group. Who goes to the, yeah. <laughs> the, they, these ladies on a Monday, they just meet together and they crochet and they put the worlds to right. But that's what love looks like. You know, just hanging out together and loving one another on our Friday lunchtime. Some of us guys get together and we eat together and um, encourage one another and take the mickey out of each other in love, of course. And, and love hangs out. You know, just being willing to be one another is part of being united in love. It's part of being one heart. It's just saying, you know, actually, I've got eno enough love that I want to be with these guys. Yeah. I want to go out for a meal with them. I want to ask some, uh, someone to come over for tea or whatever it is. You know, it's still being church. Yeah. One heart, one love. And care for the person, not the function. This, this week's been, I think the Lord tests you when you're preaching. But this week's been just like an illustration. I put this point down and then everything started to happen about caring and taking an interest in one another's lives. I've been at the hospital. Um, I've been praying for people who have been going into hospital for operations. I, I've been hearing encouragements about people's finances. We were hanging out with uh, a couple about potentially becoming deacons in the future. And, you know, we just have to be interested in each other's lives. That's what one love looks like, loving one another looks, messaging one another. You know, it'd be great this afternoon if WhatsApp exploded because um, you were all messaging one another and encouraging one another and we were encouraging each other. You know, sometimes that little bit of interest makes a lot of difference, you know. You know, I know we've got people in hospital right this moment who need our prayers. We've got people going through tough times. But there's enough love in this church that we can be one 
If we pursue this with a passion and a desire and we make it an, an intention to love one another and take an interest in each other's lives, not just because, oh, you're serving on children's work this week. No, because I love you. I love you. And with the best will in the world, none of us, not even super pastor who is not the pastor here, unfortunately, <laughs> can keep a check on 200 people. We need to share this task as one family. Loving one another as Christ told us about. And, and sometimes in it, you know, church, we're going to have to be vulnerable. We're actually going to have to open up and be vulnerable about our weaknesses and our difficulties and our sin. And we're going to have to say, please, will you love me enough to pray with me? Billy Graham said something once. He said, tears shed for self are tears of weakness. But tears shed for others are a sign of strength. You know, and it's not wrong to cry about your own situation. That's not his point. But his point was, if we are so invested in one another that we can shed tears over one another, our unity, our oneness is at a strong level. Do we love each other enough to weep over each other? And let's honor each other, church. You know, how do you talk about each other behind our backs? You know, are, are we critical because unity comes from honoring each other whether I'm looking at you now or, or not looking at you? And this is one finger that way and three fingers this way. We have to honor one another and love one another if we are going to achieve this level of unity. Is this helping us? You see, if we love selflessly, perhaps, uh, Paul, you could pray for me, that would be great. Um, if we love selflessly in this way, Christ and our brothers and sisters, then blessing is going to come upon us. That's God's promise. You know, we had um, some thefts in the church um, a, a while ago. Just um, something was stolen. And, you know, we were outraged that that could happen. And rightly so, you know, outraged that in the house of God, um, this was way back. Um, and of course, you're outraged, aren't you, when I share that with you? But the point is, you know, sometimes we can rob each other of blessing by coming with the wrong attitude. And yet we're not outraged. In, in our hearts, we're willing to come and worship half-heartedly or, you know, not love in the way that we're commanded to love. And the reality of that is we are stealing a blessing from one another. But if we catch the heart of this, and God, it's not us trying harder, you know. It's God's love poured into our hearts that we can pour it out. We are going to be blessed. The power of God's unity is going to come upon us. Just like Father Raniero, we're going to see the power of God. <laughs>